Mary was someone who stayed at home, I think. I think Joseph was a carpenter. Was he a carpenter? The angel came to Mary and the angel, um, the angel said, do not be afraid. You are going to have a son. He'll be the savior of the world. This is not exactly the verse, but something look it up. They just um, got to Bethlehem. There was no room, so... And the baby got wrapped in cloth. The three wise men were magi from a galaxy far, far away, also known as Mesopotamia. And they followed the star above Bethlehem to find baby Jesus because they knew that the prophecies said that he was the savior. The shepherds were afraid and the angels came. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Watching their sheep by their fire, and an angel appeared to them. There is the I, Savior. I is, bring will be born to you. I give you great news. No good news of great joy. Sometimes I forget once two minutes. It means that that God, like He lived on Earth, like like He was there on Earth. Right. Some of Shoreline's finest theologians uh, doing their work there. Uh, the Christmas story. The Christmas story has been told since it happened. And, and we each have our own Christmas story. My Christmas story that I grew up with wasn't that one or any version of that one. My Christmas story was this one. "'Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a... So you know that one, don't you, right? I didn't know the Jesus story. I didn't grow up with a Jesus story. But, but my family had Christmas. And there were things about it that were rich and meaningful. Uh, one, of, one of the things in my family growing up that was a big deal was gifts, gift giving. And so I had a list, I'm not kidding, a list of between 30 to 40 people that I was to buy gifts for starting from the time I was about five years old. Now I didn't have a, really a lot of income at five. I didn't have a lot of money. But I remember my mom, I, 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 she either gave me a $10 or a $20 bill. I think it may have been a $10 bill to buy 30 to 40 gifts. And I had to buy them myself and wrap them myself. That was our, our family. So, so now you say, well, how in the world could you buy 30 to 40 gifts with $10? Well, two words and one letter. Pick and save. Anybody remember pick and save? It, it's the precursor to dollar stores. Pick and save makes dollar stores look fancy. Pick and save. I, mean, I, I remember as a little kid going down the aisles that's where we go every year to buy our Christmas gifts. And you can get like, oh, like here's you know, these four or five people. They would like another keychain. You get like 37 cent little keychain. That would be a gift there. And then it would go down, you know, kind of, oh, now a candle or a coffee mug. And I would just, and then I would wrap them all and give the gifts out. And then on Christmas day, we'd open gifts. And that was part of our family thing. And there, it, was, it was great. It was fun. And it was fun getting gifts and giving gifts. That was part of our journey. That's part of my Christmas story. Another big part in our family was Christmas tree. The Christmas tree. We would actually go about a month or two before Christmas to a Christmas tree farm. Anybody remember those? They still have those around where you go and you walk up and down the aisles and the rows of trees and you'd finally find what the whole family would agree on and they would put a tag, you know, the Harney family and they would clamp it on there. And then we'd go back about two weeks before and be, the whole ceremony, they'd cut down the tree and we, if it was small enough, we would jam it in the back of the station wagon. And if it wasn't small enough, we would strap it with twine on top of the station wagon. That was always exciting. And then on the way home, uh, we would only once a year we would do this, we'd stop and get an A&W root beer at the root beer stand. So some of you are going, some of you remember that, right? That's part of my story. Maybe that's part of your story. So, so, so there were gifts, there was a tree, and then family, being with family. That was part of our story. Every Christmas Eve, my whole life growing up, we'd get in the station wagon, back in the three kids, then when finally Lisa and Jason came along, the five kids, but we'd pack and we'd drive up to Pasadena because both of my grandmothers lived in Pasadena. And this is how it went. My parents would say, hey, kids, 
We get to go to Granny's house. Granny was my dad's mom, and it was exciting to go to Granny's house. We get to go to Granny's house. Yay! And we pack and we go to Granny's house. Then we were there in Pasadena. Just five minutes away was where my grandma lived, my mom's mom. And my parents at some point in the evening would say, kids, we have to go see grandma. So some of you think that's kind of sad, isn't it? That's just the way it was in my family. This is our family tradition, right? So we'd go over to grandma's house, and we'd kind of go into her living room, and she could last about, five, about 10 to 12 minutes with kids in the house. And then she'd say, okay, get the kids out. And we'd be put outside. And uh, some of you are nodding your heads like, I remember that. Um, and, and, they, uh, and, then we'd, we'd, and within about 15 minutes, we'd be in the car heading back over to Granny's house. And we'd kind of enjoy the rest of the evening. That's, that's my story. But w- with all the things that I, and, I, and I love being with family. I love the Christmas tree. I love the gifts. All that was fun. But even in my young heart, I can look back now. And there was something inside of me that was wondering if there was more. That this, that this Christmas holiday, and I, I didn't know that there was another story. The only story I knew was the Santa Claus night before Christmas story. I didn't know the Jesus story. And, and I, think, I think when I look back now, even as like a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, I was, I was longing for something transcendent. Now, I wouldn't have put it in those words when I was five, but inside of me, there was sort of, this, is, there, is there more than this? Is there more than just presents? And is there more than just trees? And I felt like there was something more going on with this whole Christmas thing, but I wasn't sure what it was. And, and, and so what, what I came to realize, what I now realize as a, as a Christian, and as a pastor, is that there's a longing of the human heart. I think built, hardwired into our souls is this longing for more, for something beyond just, just the, what we can touch in this world, something bigger than that. We hope and look for something, and if you're a note taker, there's a place to write these down in your bulletin. We hope and look for something unchanging, eternal, and yet personal. We, we want something more than just the stuff of this world. When I look back at Christmas and my Christmas story, everything in my Christmas story orbited around one being, and that being was me. It was the presents I would buy, the presents I would get, how I would enjoy the family time, what seat I got in the station wagon, and all my whole Christmas story orbited around me. I didn't know that there was a center to the Christmas story bigger than me, but something inside of me wondered and longed if there was more. And I think that God puts that inside of all of us. And there's all kinds of people gathering at Shoreline today here and in the family worship venue and online in our three services this morning and one in the afternoon. There's people from every different walk of life for some of you to say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for six months or a year or for 10 years or for 50 years. And I know the Christmas story, the story of Jesus. There's something bigger. But I think for those that grew up like I did, without any of that story, there's a sense that there's something more going on and we want to know the rest of the story. The reality is Christmas Day is probably the most transcendent, glorious day in the history of the world because God Almighty left the glory of heaven and came among us. I mean, God moved in to human flesh, and to the human world, and walked with us, and lived among us, and ultimately gave his life for us. I think in all of our hearts, there's there's this wondering, is there a God? Is there a God who is truly at work? I think we, we ask this question, is there a God who's powerful? I actually believe that the first telling of the Christmas story doesn't come in the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Luke, where we read about the Magi and the wise men and the baby Jesus being born. I think the first telling of the Christmas story happens in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, in the first chapter and in the first verse. I mean, the story of Christmas is God coming among us, and that actually starts at the beginning of the Bible. You know, is God powerful? Is there there a powerful God who's doing things? Well, look with me at Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Listen to these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke and everything came into existence. And God said, verse three, let there be light and there was light. And God spun the galaxies into existence. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, all kinds of living creatures. I mean, think about this. The maker of heaven and earth, the God almighty who came into human history is so powerful that he spoke and the galaxies We're just spun into existence, countless stars, massive space that we can't even really comprehend. Not a galaxy, but galaxies just just strewn out beyond our comprehension. God spoke and that came to being. But I love verse 24, but God also let, let, let the land produce living creatures, all kinds of living creatures. The God who created galaxies 
also created puppy dogs. I mean, think about it. He spoke, and, and the heavens came into existence, and he spoke, and animals came into existence. The same God who created the, the galaxies created every kind of animal life. It's a glorious, powerful picture. This powerful, powerful God. And so we say, is God powerful? Genesis 1 says, yes, God spoke things into existence. But then we ask this question. Is this powerful, transcendent, glorious God also personal? Does he care about me? Does he care about you? Is he involved in our lives? And Genesis chapter 2 and 3 unfolds how personal God really is. In Genesis chapter 2, we read these words in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Look at the difference here. With the heavens, with the plant life and the animal life, God speaks and it happens. But with us, with people, there's a sense, you read the language, there's a sense that God forms, God shapes us, almost with his own hands. God shapes and makes us, and then God breathes the breath of life into us. There's intimacy, it's personal. God is powerful, he made everything. God is personal, he made and shaped us. It's amazing, it's staggering. And then as you you walk through the story, Look at verse 8 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And we're reading that part of the story in Genesis chapter 3. We tend to focus on the fact that the man and woman had messed up. They'd eaten the forbidden fruit. But, But I want you to get this picture. Here comes God Almighty. Here comes God Almighty walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Why is he doing that? He's looking for Adam and Eve. He wants to walk with them. What is Christmas? God among us. What is Genesis? God among us. This is God's first coming into the human story. And from the very beginning, God says, I want to walk with you. I want to be in relationship with you. I didn't just scatter the galaxies, start the world, make people, and then kind of say, have a nice eternity. But God wants to walk among us. That's the heart of God. And because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, God's character remains constant. So the God who made humanity and walked among us also enters history again in the Christmas story. And then it's really powerful when you realize in Genesis chapter 9, we find this word covenant starting to show up in the Bible, and it carries all through the Bible. A covenant was this agreement, this relationship, almost a... The best, the best human picture would be a marriage covenant where there's this agreement that we're going to live together in a certain way. And God never breaks his covenant. God always keeps his promises. So in Genesis chapter 9, verse 12, we read this. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come, which means for us even today. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth, between me and all of my people and all that I've made. And again and again through the Bible, God establishes covenant, this agreement with his people. I want to walk with you. I will be your God. You can be my people. That's the heart of God. He is powerful and transcendent. He is personal and with us and he is a covenant making relational God. Our hearts long for someone who is powerful, personal, and engaged in our lives. And God is all of this and more. As a five-year-old, as a seven-year-old, as a 12-year-old, I, I, I kept wondering, is there more than this? And no one had answers for me. I grew up in a completely non-church setting. But there was this God who made me, this God who loves me. I just didn't know about him. No one had told me the story. I knew it was the night before Christmas. I didn't know, and there were shepherds in the fields, and the angels came to them and announced that this child had come. But it's that story. There's nothing wrong with the twas the night before Christmas story. It's a fun story. There's nothing wrong with the tinsels and the trees and the presents. I still, we, we do that, we enjoy that. We don't have one Christmas tree at our house. We have two. We do that. We enjoy that. But there's a bigger story, a deeper story. The Bible teaches us that God's divine design is that he has made us to be in relationship with him. Do you know that? 
Do you know that God has created you and made you to be in relationship with him? And there's a part of your soul, there's a part of who you are, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian or a hardcore atheist, it doesn't matter. God made you and designed you with something in you that yearns for him and this relationship with him. And God wants to be close with us. Even when we keep God at arm's length and say, my life, my deal, I don't want you. God says, I'm here and I'm available and I still love you. And you say, well, how close? How close is God? Well, the Bible gives us picture after picture. In Psalm 23, and you may, you may know that psalm, even if you're not a church goer, uh, you may have heard some of this psalm. But I, I love these words in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And on and on, Psalm 23 goes, giving this picture of God as a good shepherd and us as his sheep. He protects us. He provides for us. He leads us to beautiful, peaceful places. That's the heart of God. How close is God? As close as a shepherd with a sheep. But it gets even closer. If you study Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4 and chapter 9, you see Jesus calling people to follow him. And each time he calls people to follow him, each time he calls them to be his disciple, to be his, his person, he says these words, come, literally follow me, walk with me, walk in my steps, walk where I go, follow where I go, watch what I do, see how I love people, see how I serve people. God's way of becoming his person is actually just walking with him. How do you do that? Because he's with you. He's near. So when Jesus walked on this earth, God with us, he said to people, walk with me. Share life with me. But it gets even more intimate. The Apostle Paul, in a church he wrote to, in a book he wrote to a church in a city called Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says these words Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. That's, that's the price of Jesus giving his life on the cross to call us his own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. What's the Apostle Paul saying? Not only is God like a good shepherd, not only does God say, follow me and walk with me, here's what he says. When you put your faith in me, I move in, not just to your life, into you. You become my dwelling place. And everywhere you go, God is with you. So in those moments where it's dark and painful and tough and you're saying, God, where are you? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you come to the cross, here's the answer, he's within you. You can't get any closer than that. That's that's intimacy at the deepest level. He is a good shepherd. He says, walk with me. And he says, I will dwell in you. Here's the reality. The maker of all things wants to be in relationship with you. There's no question about that. God wants to be in relationship with you. Here's the question. Are you interested in knowing him more? Do you want to know him more? Do I want to know him more? And some of you say, well, know God more. I've been a Christian for 20 years. I've been a Christian for 30 years. Guess what? There's still more of God to know. Well, I've been a Christian 50 years, 60 years. There's more of God to know. We're gonna have an eternity to get to know God better and we still won't fully comprehend his greatness. So if you're a follower of Jesus, here's my question. Do you want to know God more? This Christmas, do you say, I don't want to just pop into church once a week or once a, every couple of weeks and say, oh, I, I believe. I want to know God. I want a relationship with this good shepherd, with this one who says, follow me, with this one who lives within me. And if you hunger for more of God, you will find more of God. And if you're content with what you have, you might just stay right there. And I would also say to those of you that aren't yet followers of Jesus, some of you are like, well, I just came to my family's for Christmas time and they said we're all going out for breakfast and there were donuts, I get it, and there was coffee, but also there seems to be a big long talk. Um, You know, 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 do I want to know God more? I know God like zero. Well, here's the beauty of knowing God zero. Anything you learn is more, right? You can know God more than you know God right now. I was at a point where I knew God not at all. But I started knowing who God was. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I would invite you to say, I want to know God more. To say, God, if you're there, I want to know you. I remember my my first prayer. My first prayer, because I didn't grow up in a home where I wasn't taught to pray. My first prayer was a prayer to actually receive Jesus. I'd never prayed before. I've been around some church stuff as just as as a in my teenage years, and before I became a Christian, I heard a little bit about Jesus. I didn't know a lot, but then I heard the story, his story. 
the Christmas story of Jesus. And my first prayer went, I can give you, not word for word, but very much like this. God, I don't even know if you're real. And I don't know if this whole thing about Jesus is real and true. But God, if you're really there, and Jesus, if you really died on the cross to wash me clean, and if you want my life, and if you want to fill me with your joy and your love and all those things that I've been hearing about, if you want my life, you can have me. That was about it. I'd never held a Bible in my hand up to that point in my life. I didn't know much. But I want to tell you something. At that moment, my life changed. Within about six hours, God called me to be a pastor. You're like, I'm not sure I want to pray that prayer. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not saying that would happen to you. I'm just saying for me, it was that real and that profound. My life was changed. I still didn't have a lot of answers. I've been a pastor now for about 30 years. I've been a Christian for over 40 years. I still don't have answers for everything. There's still things I'm trying to understand about faith and about the Bible. But I know this Jesus, and I know his love, and I know his grace, and that has all, all, made all the difference in the world. This series is called Behold. And today we're declaring this. Behold, Jesus offers what our heart longs for, what we long for, what we need, what we hunger for most. It is found in Jesus. Because in Jesus we see the God who created us, the God who wants to live within us. In the book of Colossians chapter one, there's maybe one of the most rich, meaningful, theological passages in all the Bible. I could preach for months on this one passage, just a few verses, but I want to read just a little bit of this picture of who this Jesus is. The Son, Jesus, listen to this, is the image of the invisible God. You see Jesus, you've seen God. The firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. In Jesus, all things hold together. As I've walked as a Christian and as a pastor, I've talked with lots of people about the Christian faith. And one of the things I hear again and again, one of the themes I hear come back again and again is the idea that, well, why would God, if you even believe in God, why would God leave heaven and be born as a human being? It doesn't even make sense to most people. My dad has said to me on many occasions, you know, I can kind of understand the idea of God, but the idea of God becoming a man, becoming a person, just doesn't make sense to me. And I'd heard this story through the, year, uh, through the years as a young Christian. I read it, I think, in one place and heard two or three other pastors share a story. And so I kind of pulled together. And I don't know um, if this story actually happened or not. Sometimes you'll hear stories and it's sort of a story with a lesson. And sometimes it actually happened. Uh, but I, um, I remember kind of taking this story and putting it together into one story. And, and it really captures the idea of why would God leave heaven and become a person? So I want to just share that story with you. There was a woman who attended church faithfully and was a sincere follower of Jesus. She believed in God and accepted that Jesus had entered human history as a man, that he had died to pay the price for sins. Everyone who knew her could see that her faith was authentic and that she understood God's love for her. Her husband was a kind man and loved her very much. He did not believe in Jesus or in God, but he never held his wife back from her faith. He could see that it was real for her, so he encouraged her, but he didn't embrace it himself. Every so often, the woman would invite her husband to attend church with her words, honey, could you come with me just once? He responded the same every time. It makes no sense to me. Why would God leave heaven and come as a human being? If there is a God, I can't comprehend why he would ever become a man and walk on this earth. I just don't get it. The woman felt sad, but she would head off to church alone and pray that one day her husband would understand and accept that Jesus really did come to show the way to God. Her prayer was that the love she experienced each day as she walked with Jesus would one day fill the heart of the man she loved the most. One Christmas Eve, the woman thought, I will try one more time. I will invite my husband to the Christmas candle, uh, candlelight service. When she gently extended the invitation... He gave the same response he had always given. As she headed off to church alone, the snow began to fall and the wind began to blow. Her husband sat by the fire to read a book. After almost an hour, he heard a thump on the window. Then another, another, another. Thump, thump, thump. He got up from his chair to see if the neighborhood kids were throwing snowballs at the house. 
When he looked out the window, he saw that the light snow had turned into heavy storm. Then he noticed a flock of geese on the ground under his window. They had become disoriented in the storm, seen the light of his window, and tried to fly into his house. He could see that they were injured and confused. So he put on his coat, a hat, and boots, and quickly went out to see if he could help. When he came near the geese, they scurried away, more fearful of him than concerned about their pain. He opened the barn door and tried to shoo them in. Every time he got near them, they scattered in the other direction. He could not get them to go toward the safety of the barn. Finally, he was exhausted and no closer to getting the injured geese into the barn. At that moment, he thought, if only I could become a goose for just a short time, I could lead them to safety. They're hurt. They're confused. They're scared of me. If I could become one of them, I could lead them to safety. At that moment, a church bell rang in the distance and he fell to his knees in the snow. He prayed for the first time in his life, dear God, I think I'm beginning to understand why you had to come as a man and what Christmas really means. I think for the first time, I'm beginning to see who Jesus is and why he came. Jesus, if you are trying to lead me to safety, please teach me to follow you. If you are out there and love me that much, I give you my life. I love that prayer because it's very much like my first prayer. It's a prayer saying, I don't have it all figured out. But if there is a God like that, I want to know that God. If that God would actually come among us into this world, I want to know that God. So at Christmas, what should we do? We should unwrap and enjoy the gift you've been waiting for. The question is, how do I receive the gift of Jesus? And how do I walk with him? I mean, every, and I, when I say receive Jesus, I mean for the first time, but also for the thousandth time. To keep taking hold of Jesus and walking more closely with him. How do you receive Jesus? Here it is in three simple statements. I believe, I receive, and I follow. So I believe in Jesus, I receive the gift he offers me, and I will do my best to follow him. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in the book of Romans. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you pro profess your faith and are saved. You see, in the ancient world, belief and action were tied together. There was no sense, oh, I, I believe this idea, but it doesn't change me. In our world today, we can believe all kinds of things, but they don't really change our lives. In the ancient world, belief always had this sense of movement and action. But it, it's, it's that way still in some ways. If I said to you right now, if I said, listen, we just got word, there is a wild lion that just got let loose right near Shoreline Church. Merry Christmas, have a good day, enjoy, and you head out of here, right? You're going you're gonna to walk out, if you believe me, you're going to walk out of here a little, like, you're going to walk out lion watching, right? I mean, it's going to impact how you walk out of here. Just for those who are getting nervous, there's no wild lion running around the church. But, but, you know, but that would impact our actions. If I said to you right now, listen, I got permission from our, our church board, our leadership team, in this service, we took 10 crisp $100 bills, put them in one envelope, thousand dollars and taped it under one of the seats in the worship center <laughs> see some of you are already like reaching under your seat some of you are reaching under the seats of the people next to you you know please don't but uh you know if you believe that we didn't okay just for the record we didn't tape it but if i if you believed me you'd be you it would move you to action right if i said to you this is a christmas gift i have for you it's a little envelope it says merry christmas on it and i came to you i said listen um, I want to give this to you. Merry Christmas. Uh, there's a $25 Starbucks gift card in here. Merry Christmas. Now, if you believe me, you're going to open the card. You, well, you'll receive the gift. I would if I was you. And you're going to follow through and do something. You're going to go shop and get a little coffee. Have a nice time. And you'd be crazy if you didn't. Now, what if I said to you, no, no. It's not a Starbucks gift card in here. I put in here a $200 gift certificate to your favorite restaurant in Monterey. If you believe, if you receive, you're going to follow up and go out and have a nice meal. Now, let's push it further. And you'd be crazy to not open it, right? If I, if I went, so listen, what's in here is a blank check. And you can write that check for whatever it would cost to pay off your mortgage on your house or your townhouse or your condo. And if you don't have a house or townhouse or condo, use the check to buy one. 
if you believe me, you'd be crazy to not open the envelope, right? This is Christmas. Jesus comes and says, Merry Christmas. This is my life, my love. All that I have and all that I am, I've given to you. And in me, you can find the joy you've always longed for, the peace you've always hoped for, the strength you can't seem to find on your own. If you let me move into your life and wash you clean, all the guilt and shame that you carry could be washed away. Do you believe? Will you receive? Will you follow Jesus? And some say yes. And some say no. What Jesus doesn't do is force himself on anybody. But the Bible says he offers himself to everybody. And my hope and prayer this Christmas <clears throat> is that you've either received that gift or you say, I want to. If you want to go, if you're, if you're saying, I'm still trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing on your way out, go by the Connection Center and say, hey, I'd love that we, we've got Bibles for anybody who wants a free Bible and a 50-day reading plan to start knowing the Bible. You can call our church and meet with a pastor. We'll just set up a time with, any, with a pastor to get with you anytime you want to to come in and just talk. say, I want to know more about knowing Jesus. If your heart's longing, if you know Jesus, keep growing in that faith. I grew up with presents and Christmas trees and family time. And I'll stand here and tell you, I still love all those. Those are great. I grew up with, "Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. But now I know that unto us a child is born. Unto us a son has been given. God has come among us because that's what God wants, a relationship with you. If you know him, walk with him. If you don't, his arms are open. The invitation is there. And all you need to do is receive it. Lord Jesus, I pray. And as we continue into this Christmas Eve Sunday and, and into Christmas tomorrow, I pray that we will enjoy the people and the decorations and the gifts and whatever, whatever stories are told and the laughter. Let us enjoy all of that. But I pray, oh God, above all, all things, that we will know the gift of Jesus. We will receive the gift of Jesus. If we have that gift already, let us delight in you, Jesus, and know you more. And if we have not yet come to know your love and your grace and your story, Lord, we've heard it today. Let us believe and receive and learn to follow you, Jesus, all the days of our life. We pray this for your glory.